Welcome to this video. My name is Mark Scythian. The date today is August 23rd, 2024. So this is a design that was posted in a previous YouTube video on August 1st, 2024, taken from the Alternative Power Concepts Part 2 video. And this is the non-combustion compressed hydrogen gas piston engine though very environmentally friendly just like the General Motors compressed air engine. The test will be for cost effectivity to the consumer and so as proven in the previous video GM's air engine is not cost effective so let's find out if Honda Corporation's compressed hydrogen gas piston engine is cost effective or not. So assume that you go to a hydrogen filling station and 20 US gallons of liquid hydrogen are filled into the tank. So we need to know that the gas expansion ratio of liquid hydrogen to gaseous hydrogen is 1 to 848. So this is the gas expansion ratio, GER. So then it goes through the vaporizer unit and we'll focus on one gallon increments from liquid to gas, then pressurized into the 32 dry gallon US tank, uh, 32 dry gallon tank volume. So we take the 848 and when it comes to a dry gallon of volume, there is actually 4.4 liters, not 3.8 liters, as with a liquid gallon of volume. So what we're doing here is we're going to convert the 848 US dry gallons taken from one liquid gallon of liquid hydrogen and convert this into liters. So 3731.2 dry liters of hydrogen gas is taken from the one liquid gallon of liquid hydrogen. So we know there's 1000 cc's to a liter So that equates to 3.7312 million cubic centimeters of compressed hydrogen gas into the 32 dry US gallon tank. After finding its cube root, we calculate 155.1 linear centimeters from which we convert to linear meters. 1.551 followed by finding its cube. So we will have 3.73 cubic meters of compressed hydrogen gas into the tank for every one liquid hydrogen gallon that's vaporized. So if we focus on 32 US dry gallons of volume and we convert this volume value into cubic meters we calculate 0 0.1408 cubic meters visiting the ideal gas law or the state equation we can find out what kind of pressure gauge pressure compressing 3.73 cubic meters of hydrogen gas into a volume of 0 0.1408 cubic meters. So we know there's 0 0.5906 pounds per US gallon for one liquid gallon of liquid hydrogen. 
and we know there's 454 grams per pound and the molar mass of hydrogen is 2 grams per mole. So that is 536.3 moles of hydrogen. Universal gas law constant 8.314 joules per mole degree Kelvin for R. And then the intercooler and vaporization system that has to be designed to maintain this ambient temperature. So 59 degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 times 5 ninths. 15 degrees Celsius plus 273 to 88 degrees Kelvin, the absolute temperature. So if we multiply these three values, NRT, and then divide it into the fixed volume of the tank, we calculate 9.12 megapascals of gauge pressure so this is equal to 1323 pounds per square inch gauge pressure. So that's what's in the tank from one gallon of liquid hydrogen vaporized into gas, into uh, gaseous hydrogen. And then we'll use uh, atmospheric pressure of about 14, we'll say 14.1 pounds per square inch rather than 14.7. Most likely, we're not perfectly at mean sea level. Converted into pascals. And then added to the gauge pressure. So our absolute pressure is 9.217486 megapascals absolute pressure, which is 1337 PSI absolute pressure, compressed hydrogen gas pressurization per one liquid gallon of hydrogen vaporized. So if we were to revisit the state equation, aka the ideal gas law, we know NRT represents the potential energy of a gas. So we're able to just multiply the absolute pressure times the tank volume in Pascal's absolute pressure times cubic meters respectively. So every liquid gallon of hydrogen will yield a potential energy of 1.2978 megajoules. So after labeling these calculated units and values, we also need to provide an equal amount of energy to compress that gas into the tank, not just relying on the expansion ratio itself because we're holding this at standard temperature and pressure. So at the very least, we would need 21,630.37 watts of in this case, electrical power to the boost pump divided into its efficiency, so 33,277.5 watts. That could either be AC true power inverted from the DC battery, or it could be the DC battery power itself as a lithium ion system that's also on electric vehicles. So either or, we would have 33.3 kilowatts, and let's say the ramp up time to vaporize a liquid gallon is designed to be a very user-friendly 60 seconds. So that's 1 60th of an hour times the kilowatt value. So it's actually uh, not a big load per gallon. However, we need to find out what kind of mileage we get from this pressurization. So 0.56 kilowatt hours of electrical consumption to pressurize that gaseous vaporization into the tank. So one U.S. gallon of gasoline 
its potential energy or PE is equal to the 120,000 BTU per US gallon energy density of gasoline multiplied times 1056 joules per BTU. So one US gallon of gasoline, 126,720,000 joules. So in under 20 seconds, or maybe 15 seconds, this is how much potential energy can be pumped into your tank at a conventional gas station for just $3.45. And so the efficiency with respect to what well, thermal efficiency would be in a combustion engine, this being a compressed pneumatic type engine running off compressed hydrogen gas pressure would be a two-stroke system delivering the pressure spike or the pressure gradient immediately after top dead center without needing a compression cycle. So the approximated equivalent thermal efficiency if it was combustion is at 50% efficiency. So the gasoline piston engine, regardless to technological advances, will have a thermal efficiency of 30% or less. So the factor of efficiency greater is 1.67 with this particular compressed gas powered piston engine. So again, we can take the available potential energy from one liquid gallon of liquid hydrogen vaporized into gaseous hydrogen and compressed in the tank 1.2978 megajoules and we can divide this into the potential energy of one gallon of gasoline 126.72 megajoules and so every gallon of gasoline on average will yield after factoring out the efficiency losses approximately 22 miles per every gallon on the highway fuel economy. So the equivalent return on every liquid hydrogen gallon in the tank is equivalent to 0.22 miles then multiplied times the efficiency adjustment of factor increase of 1.67. So every liquid gallon of hydrogen will yield 37 US miles plus the 0.56 kilowatt hours to pressurize that gas into the tank per liquid hydrogen gallon so if we wanted to get 300 mile range, we would need 810.8 gallons of liquid hydrogen plus 454 kilowatt hours. And so if we were going approximately 70 miles per hour on the highway with this sort of engine, this would translate to approximately 300 divided into 70 miles per hour. So 4.3 hours. And so if we scale down the kilowatt hours to a factor of four versus one, then it comes down to 113.5 kilowatt hours plus 811 gallons of liquid hydrogen. So in the big picture, though another great environmentally friendly engine, we will need uh, a considerable amount of liquid hydrogen to even have a practical range. And a gallon of hydrogen is gonna cost more than a dollar a gallon. So I don't think anybody wants to spend over $800 to fill up their tank so this has actually less cost effectivity than the 
compressed air engine from General Motors. But on the flip side, there is three times more energy density in liquid hydrogen combustion, not compressed hydrogen, compared to gasoline. So that means we have 126,720,000 times three. So this comes to 380 million 160,000 joules per gallon of liquid hydrogen. So many will say, why are you compressing gaseous hydrogen to run a piston engine? That sounds so silly. Very true, because for decades, engine designers, structural engineers, mechanical engineers, physical chemists, automotive technicians, researchers, and everybody in the game have been trying to seal gaseous hydrogen within a conventional four-stroke piston engine arrangement and incrementally sealing compressed or injected hydrogen gas due to its extremely low molar mass and extremely small atomic radii as it is the lightest gas in the periodic on the periodic table of elements. There's no poppet valve train or reed valve train system, plate or poppet, that is able to consistently seal hydrogen gas under a combustion system. So that means, yes, it works for some time, but when it goes through a battery of tests, there is no type of mechanical valve train or material on the market, including graphene and graphite and carbon nanotubes. Everything's been tried, and it's almost, it, I will never say impossible, because nothing's ever settled in science. Science is always about discovering things that were not known and changing the parameters of the game. So what is existing today, science once said was impossible until more information was discovered, hence the term research. It's there, but you have to find it. But as of now, the reliability of sealing gaseous hydrogen for combustion within any type of piston engine arrangement is wholly unreliable. And this also risks not just property or investment loss in the machine, but intermittent safety liabilities. So yes, it could work, but then every thousand cars run into a catastrophic explosion. So that cannot be approved and it is thus technically not only unreliable, but unsafe. So all of the testing over the decades to run piston engines on hydrogen gas for combustion have failed. So Honda decided to think outside the box and build a compressed hydrogen gas piston engine, similar to the compressed air, but using a lighter molar mass gas and the return is that the cost effectivity is even worse than the compressed air engine from General Motors. So of course the prototype and the product was successful, the material science, the 3D printing, the industrial state of the art to push the limits on material science practicality and feasibility is all not just possible, but industri it could be industrialized. However, again, the cost of the consumer, not good. So the conclusion is the compressed hydrogen gas piston engine rolled out by Honda Motors in Japan is also not cost effective. And the 20 US gallons of liquid hydrogen in the tank is 
grossly insufficient for a quantity. So in the following videos, I'm going to cover a few more uh, alternative power applications, the uh, solar and solar wind and the electric vehicle energy densities and a return on investment and the whole cost apparatus and see where the entire sustainability lies in future developments but not ignoring the advancements in material science. So material science is the reason why all the advancements in technology move forward. So that particular field, materials engineering, supersedes the mechanical and the electrical engineering fields because it is closer to a physics and math major as you're going into both the classical and quantum sciences of chem, physics, and biology. And so the materials are not just structures, but they're also electrical materials, chemical materials, etc. Uh, transferring and transmitting signals. Again, you're going to need a material to do that. And so the feasibility of making pipe dream fictitious technology a reality going from science fiction to science fact is made feasible through the material science advances. However, has the cost come down? And so we cannot write off these technologies as scrapped, but we have to find ways to derive these materials such as hydrogen and compressibility and or methods of decreasing the price by discovering other technologies and systems to make these tech, uh, tech, technologies feasible. However, all these great and environmentally friendly technologies are lacking the energy density. So I'm going to cover that in the EV, wind power, and solar presentations that will follow. But there is a solution and aside from the enormously high energy density of crude oil and its low cost and the fact that our modern gasoline piston engines burn all fuel, we do not have any unburnt gas, we have anti-detonation sensing, some extremely high compression ratios like 12 to 1, 11.3 to 1, 11.7 to 1, etc. So we're able to vaporize and combust all of the fuel, not to mention that octane in gasoline has nothing to do with the energy density, whether gasoline has 86 or 110 octane, it still will have 120,000 BTU, BTUs per gallon of gasoline, but the only thing that octane does is slows down the flame front combustion speed during higher compressions. Now we don't need that property in fuel or gasolines anymore because all automobiles manufactured after 2005 have the anti-detonation sensing. So if you have a newer car or a late model car, you always use the lowest octane because all of the gasolines have phosphate detergents in them, so premium is really not relevant to cars with anti-detonation sensing. So if you have an older car that's high performance from the 1990s and its compression ratio is let's say over 7.5 to 1, then you've got to start using mid-grade 89 octane. And if it goes up anything higher, some high-end automobiles like Lincoln Continental, and Mercedes-Benz and BMW from the 90s uh, had some pretty high compression ratios, uh, 10.1 to 1, etc. So you had to use premium, but that's not the case after about 2005. Definitely by 2008, 2010, all cars from all makes and models have uh, 11 to 1 compression ratio, 
and that's not possible to run such a low octane gasoline unless there is anti-detonation sensing on those automobiles coupled with the value, uh, variable valve cam timing so you're able to go to 100% volumetric efficiency without the flow separation on the piston and manifold structures including the valves. So all of these huge advances have already taken place in the gasoline piston engine industry for automobiles and what is very important to know is that with gasoline, not kerosene, not diesel, but not heat of air compression, but only gasoline, that the optimized flame front speed is 100 feet per second. So every time the flame front speed exceeds 100 feet per second, then we run into detonation or the knock. And that is equivalent to combustion, which pushes on the piston, whereas detonation is an explosion like slamming a hammer on the piston. So you used to get in a lot of trouble if you had a high compression engine and you did not use a higher octane, but that's a thing of the past because of anti-detonation sensing. So what else happens on modern automobile gasoline piston engines is that the carbon monoxide is reheated through superheated catalytic conversion and the 74 moles of carbon monoxide are broken down into 14 moles of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is plant food. Carbon dioxide plus sunlight plus water yields photosynthesis. And so then the plants, they excrete oxygen, oxygen gas back into the environment. And so good, uh, fortunately, the Supreme Court has ruled uh, backing scientists and engineers that carbon dioxide is not a greenhouse gas because it is plant food. So if you want more forestation, for example, if we go back to the Paleolithic age when the entire earth was green and full of forestation, the CO2 content was somewhere around 4,300 parts per million. And today we're at 520 parts per million CO2. So again, that was a point of interest until proven otherwise, and any biologist or botanist could have validated that the CO2 is distributed back into the atmosphere, and then by means of gaseous osmosis is gonna be absorbed by the forestation of the plants. And so another issue is the water vapor. So what happens on the modern gasoline piston engines today which are radically advanced compared to even 25 to 30, 30 years ago. We can't compare modern piston engines today to anything that was out in the 1970s and the 1980s. That might as well have been thousands of years ago in technology. But today it is highly illegal to build a gasoline piston engine for which these requirements are not occurring. Number one, there cannot be any unburnt gas. So we have direct injection right into the cylinder of the fuel, not indirect injection, like even two port injection from 15 or 20 years ago. So we have uh, direct injection. We have these extremely high compression ratios. We have uh, direct injection with electronic fuel injection, which is a purely digital, digitized system that works with the exhaust gas recirculation system. We have a power recovery with respect to heating so your entire uh, heating and cooling system, your radiator to your engine, latent heat, mass times temperature, and your cooling system are all cross-exchanging power distribution curves with respect to the temperature. So there's so much conservation of energy going on in cars today that even your exhaust nozzles are running a lot cooler than they did so there's nothing, almost nothing wasted, including the one-third power loss to heat the block, right? And then you can reheat and return some of that energy. And then you have the one-third that you get to use, and then the one-third loss to compression and friction, etc. So today, the modern gasoline piston engine is so beyond radically effective for complete 
combustion of the fuel, not to mention breaking down the 74 moles of carbon monoxide into 14 moles of carbon dioxide. So what's left after gasoline breaks down in an engine? It is the CO2 and the water vapor. There's very extremely trace amounts of oxides of nitrogen, NOx, and oxides of sulfur, SOx, but they are partially an environmental problem, yes. So again, even though modern gasoline piston engines are so environmentally friendly comparatively to how they used to be, there's still a way of running an alternate alternative power technology that doesn't have the emissions. And so there's another greenhouse gas that is often missed, and it's actually water vapor, because water has the highest absorption and rejection rate of any type of substance. So it takes a thousand BTUs to vaporize a pound of water. So if you see a pound of water puddle on the sidewalk, and irrespective to the time, a cumulative 1,000 BTUs are required to convert that pound of water into vapor. So that is going to be an absorber of heat. Now, if that water vapor rejects the heat, then the exact opposite happens, and the water vapor condenses back down into rain. So this is the conservation of energy. And because of it, you can have radical changes in climate due to an excess of water vapor. But then again, that is also splitting hairs because we have something called the jet stream, we have horse latitudes, we have trade winds. So again, just like we have the conservation of energy, we have the conservation of matter. It cannot be created or destroyed. So there's a distribution. So yes, what people are doing on the earth is not helping. And yes, there is climate change as in uh, temperature inversions, extremes greater than, less than, but we have a series of factors involved in climate change. Yes, industrialization, yes, partly humans, yes, but you have to also remember that the sun, our solar sun, makes up 99.99% of the mass of our solar system. So we have nine planets and our sun and only point, uh, we'll say a 1%, I won't go point. 99% of the mass of our solar system is the sun. 1% of the solar system, that means all nine planets are only 1% of the mass of the solar system that we're in. And right now the sun is experiencing a solar maximum for which its magnetic field has either collapsed itself and then reverting back to oversaturation. And so this is just called the solar maximum. And there's a gradient running close to a 0 0.8, 0 0.9 limit. And our limit right now is above that. So what does this mean is that there's a climate change occurring on all the other planets simultaneously with different chemistry, for example, a sulfuric acid clouds of Venus, and then we run into a very rich carbon dioxide uh, upper atmosphere of Venus, and so those gases are reacting as well into temperature extremes. Of course, on those planets, uh, like Jupiter, a gas planet with uh, exponentially higher gravity than the Earth, and planets like Venus, which have this high temperature gradient of about 900 degrees Fahrenheit, all of these are reacting as well to the solar maximum that the sun has changed at. So what we have is wind storms that are not below supersonic speeds, but perhaps exceeding the supersonic curves on Venus. And Jupiter is just extremely crazy because it is a gas planet under so much gravity that it solidifies. So it's like re reverse uh, sublimation, the opposite. It's going through the deposition of a gas to a solid and it's gravity curves, but that's all relative. We could go on all day about the details of every planet, but when something that 
comprises 99% of the mass of the solar system is going through some extreme magnetic solar maximums, everything's going to change with respect to its nature of limitations. And so then it is confined to the individual events and behaviors on each planet. So again, it isn't one group or things to be blamed for the climate change, although the climate change is occurring. So we have hot house versus albedo effect, which every geophysicist and geologist is uh, familiar with. And they uh, started to pick up the solar extremes with respect to its magnetic field as early as the late 70s. Uh, so that's not going to take much effort now because of these events to then create climate change extremes. And so again, it's a little bit more than focusing on one technology to quote unquote save the world when it also requires a certain economy to do so. So you make the greatest technology in the world and then you go broke and nobody has a job anymore. So this is another issue that has to be considered that there has to be a resource curve to back the printing of money or else then the individual buying power of every dollar loses its buying power and we call that inflation. So this video is uh, covering the second environmentally friendly engine that has actually been created but is grossly cost ineffective. So this is not the end. I'm making a few more videos to connect all of these different environmentally friendly technologies with respect to their energy density curves and then connecting their cost effectivity so that eventually there's a greater awareness on the management of leading to a cost effective solution. So we're always learning from each technology to culminate into a winning technology that is environmentally friendly as well as cost effective. So after the wind, electric vehicle and solar technologies videos are made, so about three more, I'm gonna focus on another last video which actually pinpoints the source of very cost effective and highest energy density source from going right from a containment source to electricity. So please stay tuned for the following videos. Please subscribe and like. And this is a continuum series focusing on raising awareness to the abstract and gray areas involved in scientific development. Thank you for watching this video and have a great day.